Your healthy community is underwritten by the Quantum Foundation. Quantum Foundation is dedicated to advancing access to health care and education for the residents of Palm Beach County. Quantum concentrates its mission in several areas to assure that all Palm Beach County residents have access to quality health care at reasonable cost, to improve quality of care, provide support for people with chronic health conditions, and to promote healthy communities and lifestyles through educational programming. and welcome to Your Healthy Community. I'm Tony May. We have some good news for you this evening. School violence is down around the country, but the bad news in there is that bullying is actually up. And chances are, if you're a parent, a grandparent, or certainly a teacher, you know that. In fact, one in every three children has been involved in some type of bullying. That's why my guests tonight have taken a stand, put on their pink shirts, and are joining us to tell us more. Welcome. Thank Familiar you. face, Darlene Costra from the Palm Beach County Literacy Co Coalition. Excuse me, welcome. Thank you. Sean Barry with the Center for Creative Education and Rhonda Rogers with Primetime. Welcome to you all. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Darlene, let's just start kind of at the beginning of how we ended up with these pink shirts. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard about bullying on a national level, but here in Palm Beach County, it is also an issue from what you are hearing. Absolutely, it is. As a matter of fact, the rates that are reported for bullying are quite high. But in one sense, that's a good thing because we want people, we want kids to be willing to report bullying when it does occur. And so Rhonda, at prime time aftercare programming, um, you kind of asked the kids themselves for some ideas about what they wanted to see in upcoming programs discuss Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Uh, about a year ago, we commissioned a focus group. We actually got a chance to speak with the kids. We wanted to see where the gaps were with our services. And one of the big things that came up was bullying. The kids were very concerned about being bullied. And these were third, fourth, and fifth graders. Wow. So with hearing that news, we reached out to one of our key partners, which is the Literacy Coalition here in Palm Beach County, and asked them to develop a program for us. And they did. They developed this wonderful program we call Turning Bullies into Buddies. Turning Bullies into Buddies. Correct. And when the kids were kind of talking to you about the bullying was it a specific audience that tended to get bullied more was it girls more than boys was it you know somebody maybe who wasn't as um, as athletic what was there a genre that really was a target I think it was both because what we did was we met with the kids separately and the girls were very vocal where the boys drew pictures which was very telling. The boys really were able to draw things that have happened to them. So we saw this was as a problem. What kind of things would they? They were drawing the like up? violent things, guns. Really? Uh, yes, and they were. T a lot of them were talking some of the things related to gangs. So not only being bullied, but being bullied to be in a gang. Because if I don't know if you know, but gangs are a big problem here in Palm Beach County. Well, I know gangs are a problem, and I never put the two together, though. Now yes. that you said it, that makes sense. Not everyone's like, yeah, I want to be in a gang. Some have no choice. That's I right. mean, I'll hurt you if you don't join my gang. Yes. So the three, so the two of you kind of created, you know, program, I should say two of you, your organizations. And, Sean, we certainly have done stories before with the Center for Creative Education. Yes. You're theory and mission is bringing this beautiful, creative view to any problem, to try and make it, you know, kind of more acceptable, more adaptable to understanding at that level? It allows the students to express themselves actually through visual art. So what we did is we had two artists that went out to the different sites and they read the books, they discussed the books, the students drew uh, pictures relating to the storyline and then the artists took those, adapted them into large uh, murals which were put on canvas and then the students painted them and are finishing, well they painted, painted them and obviously were displayed a few weeks ago and so we were very excited about all of those. And we actually well. we actually got a chance to, before it was finished, see one of those in progress at a school in Lake Worth. So let's share that story with you now. For these kids at Bright Futures Aftercare Program, painting this anti-bullying banner is a fun way to spend the afternoon. Huh? But for the artist, it's so much more than that. Mr. I was a bully when I was younger, when I was in middle school. and. Uh, I was a mean kid and uh, you know my friends would laugh when I would 
try to hurt other kids' feelings, and it, I, I just did it. Dave Tripp says it's a lot easier to let kids know the pain of bullying when you have been one. For this project, they read a book about the subject and then are transforming the blank canvas into a visual representation of what they learned. This banner project is, it's, 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 again, it's putting it out there for everyone to talk about and see. And the more you do that, um, the more aware we are of it. And you're thinking twice before you do it, I think. The idea is to allow the children to feel comfortable enough to share personal stories about being bullied in a safe, and creative place. All the kids have said they've been bullied once or twice at least, and, and it, which is a shock to me to you know, have that many kids say that. The kids do seem more open once they are engrossed in an art project. That is the key to getting them help. Because I work with um, a whole variety from kids that are victims of child abuse on up to just regular everyday kids. And, um, but art is such a strong therapy for anybody. I, I, I work with uh, Alzheimer's patients as well. So, and you, you can't imagine from just sitting lethargic in a chair, they get a paintbrush in their hand and they come to life. This kind of outreach is especially important. Let's see, yes. When you consider the high technology and instant access world we now live in. Like back when we were kids, you didn't hear about that. And of course there was no internet and that's the worst. I mean, you could affect somebody worldwide by writing something about them. And um, you, you can't take that back, you know, so it's a huge, hurtful thing. As the finishing touches are put on the banner, the artist reflects on his own life picture and how his days of being a bully still now. linger. And to this day, I regret being a bully. I, I think of it every day, you know, because I, I work with a lot of different kids in, in all areas. And um, I'm just so glad to be a part of this. The banner is complete, but the lesson on turning bullies into buddies is far from over. But again, it can't be just the one day. We have to keep, keep preaching it. You know, I really believe that. So, um, Sean, that was just one of many of the banners. I know that were displayed on the big peak day is what I'm calling, but I know it had an official name. <laughs> so, Darlene, it talked, Bullying Stops Here, Pink T-Shirt Day. Pink Shirt Tell Day. Tell us how you came up with the concept of this. Actually, it was a group in Canada that came up with a concept. It was sort of a very tragic incident. A fellow was new at a school, I believe it was a middle school, and when he went in first day of school, he happened to have a pink shirt on that he got out of his closet, and immediately he was bullied by some kids there who really beat him up, made him very sorry to be at that school. But some upperclassmen saw that this was happening, and they emailed, texted everybody they knew and said, everybody, go and get pink shirts out of your closet, go to the dollar store and buy one. And the next day when the kid came to school, there was a sea of pink Aww. assuring him that this school was not gonna let bullying take place. What a great story. Yeah. So you're con taking that story, broadening it to schools all over Palm Beach County. Everyone was asked to wear pink shirts yes. on the same day, right? Uh -huh. And then Rhonda, I think in the morning there was some, some training of Teachers, talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. When Darlene approached me um, several months before the event came about us doing something, she mainly talked about the afternoon and working directly with the students. And I say, why stop there? Let's actually do something in the morning. On a monthly basis, Primetime has what we call our after-school consortium. And that is when we bring practitioners together, those folks who work directly with the youth, uh, and bring them together for some networking, some team building, and some resources. And we saw this as a great opportunity for the Literacy Coalition to actually train the staff. So what we did was we took the staff through like a mini training of turning bullies into buddies and where they went to different stations and they had an opportunity to touch and feel the curriculum. And we were hoping that from there, several more of these programs would like to be a part of the Literacy Coalition's um, bigger program. They currently are working with 10 programs and we have uh, space for many more. So 10 sites right now, is that all school sites or where where is it taught? There, there are a real variety of sites around the county. Actually, there's couple in Boca, Florence Fuller East and West, and then they go all the way up to West Jupiter uh, community groups. So they're really scattered all over the county. Some, some are city sites, they're like in Parks and Rec, but it's where kids that are in real need are congregating in after school programs. That's where we try to take the program. Now, Sean, um, talk about, I, I know you just saw some of the artwork, but, but you deal with this on a regular basis. People, yes. young children, you know, really voicing their feelings in painting or, you know, drawing or whatever it may be. 
it, it, what do the kids say to you or what have you seen that really, really messaged to you this problem? Well, I think the message, and actually I've learned this through prime time, through some of the trainings we've done with prime time, is a lot of times students are able to express themselves better in small groups. So if they're in small groups working on the banners or if they're taking their own picture, their own idea, they're more apt to do that than to make a statement in front of an entire classroom. So this gives them a chance to really express themselves in these small groups. And working together also, taking their work, putting it together, being accepted, putting this into one large banner, it makes them feel like a part of the group. It takes the whole bullying concept out. You know, so they are becoming, they're learning how to react with each other in that way. What uh, is any of it, and forgive me, I don't know the curriculum, but is any of it based on just teaching uh, some cultural lessons? Um, I don't know if the bullying is targeted to certain cultures or certain, you know, um, backgrounds, but does that get touched on at all? Actually, and I should have said this, the reason Literacy Coalition is involved in this is because what we are doing, we've developed a curriculum that is all literature based. So we are teaching about bullying and how to deal with it through wonderful books that focus on the issue of bullying, but they do it in a way that kids really enjoy reading the books. You know what I can't imagine, I, I, and my kids are older, but that there are even books that many about bullying showing that obviously it's a problem. Somebody wouldn't write a book, a children's book about mm -hmm. it. it do, they, do they break it down and do they give tips on how to deal with a bully or how to not be a bully anymore? Like, tell me the gamut of who you're touching here. Absolutely. And the important thing that we focus on, there are really three different areas. For certainly we're focusing on f the people that are bullies to try to give them strategies on how to act out their behavior in more positive ways. But we're also working with folks who are bullied for them to know what they can do. And even more importantly, all of the bystanders, all of us that see these things happen, but to give us the courage, the wisdom to know as kids, as adults, how to to deal with bullying situations and not just be a silent observer. Well, bullying is nothing new. Let you know, I mean, maybe right. it's a new mm -hmm. name, but I know young as growing up, you know, I was bullied, kids are bullied. Why why and Rhonda, maybe you can speak to this because you're you're doing after school stuff. Why is it such a big issue now? Because it has grown more violent because more kids are speaking out about it, what what do you think? I think it's more kids are being more comfortable in the, in the settings that we work very hard to, to make for them in after school, they feel more comfortable with speaking out about it. I agree, I know that I was bullied as a child myself and so I work really hard to make sure that my two young men don't have to go through that or at least if they do go through that, they know they can come to someone. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's been around, but I think because of the settings that we've made the kids very comfortable, they feel more comfortable about talking about it. Because the questions that we asked in the survey and the focus group did not really talk, would not get you to talk about bullying, but we feel like the setting that we made it very comfortable for the kids and we gave them the paper and the pen and say, just tell us how you're feeling. What programming can we bring to you? And for bullying to come up is such a large issue, they had to have been comfortable in what, their setting. What are, was there any commonalities? Again, I'm just trying to figure it out in my head. Um, geographically, um, lower socioeconomic schools had more bullying, maybe because, you know, kids are hungry when they go to school, a little more, you know, antsy. Did, did in what you learned to, to do this day and some of the general stuff they taught in the trainings, mm -hmm. was there any kind of stereotype or is it just across the board bullying? I, I really feel, and I'd be interested in what Ron and Sean think, but I really feel it's across the board. And I think things that contribute to it greatly are cyberbullying. You know, oh, there's yeah. so much going on online constantly with kids. I didn't think about that. that. instantly, you can bully somebody just by texting everybody you know some bad comment about mm -hmm. them. So mm -hmm. there's sort of an instantaneousness about the power of really uh, saying re very mean things. And I would agree with that. Our focus group um, covered the county. We met in Boca, Lantana, and Jupiter, and we heard the same thing. And those are three totally different groups of kids who did come from those varying backgrounds, and they all kind of felt like that was a strong issue for them in different ways. And Sean, you, you have a, a very one-on-one -on -one relationship with these kids because art is a little more touchy-feely, forgive, <laughs> forgive the description, <laughs> but before this day that y'all put together, were you hearing stories? Were kids kind of opening up as they did some art not related to, to the bullying project? Well, um, first of all, the, the artists that are out, which are, is Steve Browse and Dave Tripp, 
They're the ones that actually were really the close with the kids, and, and the answer is yes to that. The students are able to talk about their own experiences through the book. And, and also the question about um, why is it different? Now, I think kids now know they really have choices. Mm -hmm. They have that ability to speak out against it. And, and the one thing that came up in this that I find is so interesting, we're not just talking about how to deal with bullies, but we're turning them into buddies. Mm -hmm. And that's totally different than just stopping and learning how to deal with a bully. But it's not, we're trying to make them our friend, and how do we, what are concepts we can get to do that? Now, I know you've just started this, this, this curriculum, yes. so maybe it hasn't happened yet, but did you hear from your tin sites any stories yet of a bully that was turned into a buddy, that it actually worked, that somebody had the guts to try and implement, you know, the strategies that are being taught there? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I had the wonderful opportunity to visit our site at Coleman Park, uh -huh. and I saw banners all around the room. I saw them playing the compliment ball where they, kids that you would think would never want to say something really nice about somebody across the room were very involved in really trying to say affirming things. But we're using rap, we're using flash mobs, oh, cool. many different uh, sort of contemporary strategies to get kids into the subject matter and then actually doing something about it. And I think bringing it down to their own level clearly is, is great messaging. But I just have to throw this out. Does any of this start at home? Because for me, you're talking about behavior and you're talking about almost rudeness that then is escalated. Mm -hmm. How much of it, kind of some of the responsibility is on parents or their, or their caretakers to teach the lesson so that bullying isn't an option? in your opinion. Right. I almost feel like we need to have a program, Rhonda, yeah. for the parents. Yes. Because That's what I was, I was yeah, wondering. Yes. They really need to know how to help their kids, whether they're bullied by Sander or um, the person who is the bully. And that's something that really the parents need to reinforce at home, right. good strategies, healthy strategies, to really give the kids the message that they need. Sounds like another idea for a great program. <laughs> yeah, it does. It yeah, certainly it does. Like well, again, Bullying Day has passed, but that doesn't mean that the message behind it should die, mm -hmm. you know? And I certainly compliment, you know, you all for putting this together and hope it's expanded to other schools. If people want information about the program, maybe a teacher or school administrator is watching or a daycare administrator, how should they reach anyone? Is there a, a website or something we can give out? Certainly they can uh, contact us at literacypbc.org or I'm sure Primetime also. Absolutely. And if they're an after school site and they're interested in bully banners, they can contact, that, contact us at uh, ccefloridaorg ccefloridaorg We'll put all Got those it. up. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. No, thank you. you. This is a great program. I really hope that you do more than just one day because this is great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good. We'll put those uh, websites up right now for you if you have questions, maybe you want to get involved or get your school site involved. Here are the websites you need to log on to and we'll be right back. Well, our next guest saw a need in our community and instead of waiting for somebody else to fix it, took it upon himself to do just that. Welcome Owen O'Neill. Hi. Nice Hi. to see you. Good to see you again. And your vision turned into what is today Clinics Can Help. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about how that happened. You were a hospice nurse at I, the time? I'm still a hospice nurse with Hospice of Palm Beach County. And whenever I would attend a passing, the, uh, the darndest thing kept happening is that a family would always say, what do I do with this wheelchair? And uh, basically what happened, mom passes away, they're very broken up, and the last thing they really want to see is the equipment, the hostel bed that she was sleeping in, the wheelchair that she was using. Uh, and it kind of struck me after hearing it several times that it was really just being, like, being kind to pick up the wheelchair, put it in the back of my truck, and finding somewhere to donate it to. And to be honest, I was a little afraid of getting fired the whole time. You know, I was kind of bending the rules. But I thought, well, we'll Fine, be, do this, get this out of the way, they don't have to see it. And the darn, then the funny thing happened. After about two months of just collecting a wheelchair and giving it away and getting it a walker and finding a home for that, uh, pretty soon I was the guy people were coming to to donate wheelchairs to. And I'm also the guy that people were coming to to get a donation of a wheelchair. And it kind of just grew into sort of a hobby. 
and then uh, uh, a doctor, Dr. Gonzalez of Hospice of Palm Beach County, he's the actual, actually the medical director there now, um, said, you know, you should make this into a, a charity, an official charity. And so I got together with a buddy of mine who's a lawyer. He wrote up the paperwork, and uh, he signed on as an officer. Dr. Gonzalez signed on as another officer. We, together, we made a board, a board of directors. And just for fun, we started donating medical equipment. And at first, we were finding homes uh, from patients referred by at the cl free clinics, such as Caridad Center, right. uh, Found Care, different free clinics. And so for fun, we just called it Clinics Can Help. But it's really expanded way past that since then. So, I'm sorry. That's OK. Thank That's you. OK. I, I interrupted you. But I wanted people to get a glance into what we're talking about. So we did have a, a, some time at the actual facility. I want to share this story with you. All right. For John Torres, this trip to a small warehouse in West Palm Beach Hi, will bring oh, big changes for his family. How can we help you today? John is picking up a free wheelchair from a nonprofit called Clinics Can Help. Every day, the staff and volunteers here pass out medical equipment like this wheelchair to people who have no other means to get them. We have from hospital beds down to walkers, uh, wheelchairs, potty chairs, uh, crutches, and then we have soft supplies, items such as wound care and incontinent supplies. Continent supplies has become a big demand lately. Everything here is donated. Some comes from companies, some from hospice, much of it from private donors who are turning their own grief into something more. A good portion of our donations come from individuals, people who have had family members that have passed away, or family members that have, say, broken a leg and don't need a wheelchair anymore. The phones are busy here. The challenge is matching what is donated with callers who need the equipment. Much of that work is done by volunteers, like Pat Broderick, a former client. We assist a multitude of different people for different reasons, whether their insurance doesn't cover everything, or their insurance is limited, or they have no insurance, or they have special needs, and we can accommodate it. Pat used to work in a similar field, so she says that experience is crucial here. But it's helping people who are in similar circumstances that truly gets her up and going each day. It makes me feel good. It gets me out of the house. John Torres says the wheelchair he is loading up is invaluable. This is for my wife. Uh, she is a little uh, mobilized right now. So this will help us get her in there and, and move her around to wherever we can go. Organizers say anyone can help the folks who come to clinics can help. We really need wheelchairs. Um, we give out a lot of wheelchairs on a weekly basis. In the last couple of weeks, we've given out over 20 of them. This nonprofit clearly runs on the kindness, generosity, and commitment of others. But for volunteers and staff, there is a huge payback. I get back such satisfaction in knowing that there's people out there that, that are getting help and they people who really, really need it. So we saw that happy family that got their wheelchair, but there's really a need for more. There, there is. We always need wheelchairs. In 2011, we gave away 276 wheelchairs. So we have a, a real, if you will, a market for wheelchairs, people who need them all over Palm Beach County. We've given away many other forms of medical equipment. So for instance, we need hospital beds. We gave away 81 hospital beds in 2011. Uh, we need electric wheelchairs. We gave away 39 electric wheelchairs again in 2011. So we always need different kinds of medical equipment. Wheelchairs are probably the biggest thing. We, there's always someone in, in our home, our county, that needs a wheelchair. We also need volunteers. Volunteers are important because you important. are a very small staff. Very small staff, very low cost uh, uh, environment, which is fine, but we really do welcome volunteers from the local uh, colleges, Palm Beach Atlantic University and Florida Atlantic University volunteer their time. It's also really great to get volunteers on a professional level, people who know about marketing, people who know about graphic arts. It's a, it's a big gift for us. So if I wanted to volunteer, would it be a, a lot of hours, or can you kind of take anyone that could give you a few hours? Just about anyone who wants to give us their time is really very much welcome. You know, for instance, some people want to just help us out 
for uh, a day, and we, for instance, will be doing a, an inventory soon. So we need help with that. Going to be doing a repainting of the office and warehouse. Always need help there. But probably our, our greatest volunteers are people who work in the warehouse, cleaning and helping to re light restoring of equipment, people who answer the phone and help uh, cl uh, clients as they come in the doors. It's a big deal to get that kind of help. So uh, if I'm watching at home and I have something to be donated, but perhaps I can't get to your facility there in West Palm, do you send people to pick up stuff as well? We do pickups once a week on Fridays. Okay. We try to focus on large pieces of medical equipment because it's just so expensive nowadays with gas prices. But well, once a week I go out and pick up hospital beds and electric wheelchairs. If you have smaller equipment such as our standard wheelchairs or walkers and crutches or even wound care supplies, we do ask you to bring those in. Uh, we know it's going out of your way, but it's a big help. And you are, and I can promise you that I can give it to someone in the community who can really use it. And we're a not-for-profit, so we can give you a tax receipt. Perfect. So it's a good deal. Well, if people want to donate or want to volunteer, I'm going to put up the uh, a website and phone number there on the screen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Great, great charity. And thank you for joining us as well. Again, that uh, information will be on the Quantum Foundation website. That's also on your screen. We will see you again next time for Your Healthy Community. I'm Tony May. Until then, make it a safe and healthy week. Good night. Your healthy community is underwritten by the Quantum Foundation. Quantum Foundation is dedicated to advancing access to health care and education for the residents of Palm Beach County. Quantum concentrates its mission in several areas to assure that all Palm Beach County residents have access to quality health care at reasonable cost, to improve quality of care, provide support for people with chronic health conditions, and to promote healthy communities and lifestyles through educational programming.